Outstanding. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Marcio, Marcio, for organizing this. And thank you, everybody who's joining us today. Um, like Jeff said, my name is Vanessa, and I'm with LK and Associates. And we are a manufacturer rep company that represents several um, CDM manufacturers in this channel. We work together with our dealers. And, um, and my main job with LK, like uh, Jeff mentioned, is to assist our dealers with uh, not only um, giving them product specifications, but also supporting them to make sure that they, they get the right application and that we get to work with them at an early stage uh, to specify the right product for the right application. Um, I'm also a CEDIA outreach instructor. And CEDIA is an international trade association for companies that design, manufacture, and integrate different technologies in a home. Uh, CEDIA has over 3,500 members and is an international trade association. And, um, you know, one of the most important things that we do is this outreach program that we are doing with you guys today. This is one of the classes that, that we teach. And we, we love to get closer with our trade uh, partners, with architects, designers, uh, the building community, uh, because we have identified in the past, in the past years that we, we have to get into an early stage uh, of working together uh, with our trade partners to make sure that the experience for the end user is truly what they deserve and what they're looking for. So we want to make sure that everything is seamless. And that's the importance of this program, to make sure that um, everybody's on the same page, not only within the CDA channel, but also with our trade uh, partners. So really quick, um, the credits on this class are going to be reported to the AIA and ASID. Uh, we'll make sure that after this is completed um, and that you guys complete your surveys, uh, at that point, this attendance will be submitted to CDA so they can uh, submit it to the um, Register AIA and ASID as well. So what are we going to be covering today? So the home electronics, uh, as we said before, should integrate seamlessly. We want to give the end user the right experience and we want to make sure that everybody ends with a good taste in their mouth and that we can collaborate and work together. Um, so on this uh, course today we're going to be talking about the different three-prong approach or the three different pillars approach of hiring technology like advanced planning, design philosophy, and making sure that we have the right product select selection. We're also going to be talking about the specific challenges and the different recommendations relating to hiding the video displays, speakers, projectors, and all the different technologies that, uh, that we offer in these days. And also, we want to make sure that everybody leaves here with understanding about the innovation and the creative ways to make sure that the visual impact of electronics is lessened and to make sure that everything is low profile and is hidden, camera flash, or even invisible or even eliminated. Um, this CEU class is registered for a 0.1 CEU value, and like I mentioned before, once um, it, this will be reported, the list of the attendees will be reported um, to CDI and also to the ASID and AIA channels. And once you guys complete uh, your survey, which I'm going to be sharing with you the link at the end of um, via email at the end of this uh, presentation, and then once you guys complete that survey then your uh, certificates of completion will be sent directly to you. So just make sure that your participant has joined properly. the meeting. So just make sure your email addresses and your names are properly entered on the survey. So what are our learning objectives today? We want to make sure that review that we review the different residential systems and technologies and the different and the unique approaches. Uh, we want to discuss how advanced planning, and I'm going to say advanced planning many times today, guys, um, how design philosophy and product selection affect the proper, proper functionality of the products we're going to be installing. We're going to discuss the different methods and strategies for hiding technology in a safe and a secure environment. And we also going to analyze how we can work more efficiently together, how you can guys work together with your custom integrators or system designers, which you know, like Boca Theater, for instance, in, in this case. So we want to make sure that, that we can incorporate all these objectives at the end of this class. I also want to say, if you guys have any questions, I can add you, Jeff, but if anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. I'm going to have an intermission um, after I discuss some of the video displays. 
But if by any chance um, you guys are not understanding my point, I know um, I have a very slight accent, but if you guys um, have any doubts, please feel free to share in um, and join the meeting. All right, so um, we're going to start with this slide right here, um, systems and technologies. Everybody's seeing that, right? Yes. Okay. So we know that in the years past, uh, technology was considered just a luxury and not essential. And, you know, some part of like furnishing at home and not the infrastructure of, of the home. But residential electronic systems are not longer exotic, but expected. We will spend time today discussing the different types of uh, residential systems provided by our professionals and when we think is appropriate and we, we will recommend different strategies and methods for hiding or camouflaging the technology. So, you know, just to begin, be before we talk about anything else, I think it's important that we get it out of the park and say, you know, before talking about the different hiding technologies, what is it, what is a system integration? What does the term mean and how does it relate to electronic system professionals? So integration is just the process of using a single control to control several systems, such as your air conditioning, lighting, security, whatever programming is the backbone of the integrated system. So by doing so, many conventional control devices can be removed from site, such as uh, the thermostats or different light switches and security panels. So when each system in a home is separate, you know, we also face the lack of communication across the platforms and also not to mention the clutter on the walls that we will have. So the usage can be both simplify and enhance through the system integration by allowing communication between all these different systems and making sure that all the scenarios and that everything is met by maybe a simple app or you know, controlling different um, systems that can be done through a touch screen or a handheld remote or a smart device such an iPhone or tablet, which is very popular nowadays. Um, we know that these devices have taken the place of individual controls, and, uh, and as we see in this picture right here, uh, we notice, um, you know, how just a simple uh, control pad, a touch screen, can control the lights, can control the speakers, it can control the TV and everything in the room. So we're going to talk about the best ways to hide this technology in a room. And we're going to focus on the three-prong approach, which is the advanced planning, design philosophy, and the product selection. And the best way to hide technology is to make sure that we plan ahead. I said it at the beginning, I'm going to be pushing for this, to make sure that we integrate it into design, into the decor of the home is right from the start. Um, this three-prong approach to incorporating technology into the project starts with advanced planning. Um, I'm sure you know, like if, if one of our integrators come halfway through this, um, it's become very challenging, not to mention that the cost that this involves. So if, if we make sure that once we sit with our end users and we ask them what is it that they expect in the living room, do they want to have a theater? Um, do they want to have lighting pads? Do they want to have different art galleries in their house? Um, do they want to have different displays? Do they want to see them? So once we identify all this, we can make sure that uh, we can get in contact with our custom integrators so we can start this um, advanced planning in advance. You know, for one of the examples that I like to use is, for instance, a, a projector. You know, nobody thinks about that at times. But, you know, like think about all the, um, all, all this, you know, the specs that it takes. We need to make sure that the recess in the ceiling is properly framed. So we need to make sure that the framing crew knows, um, you know, what they need to to make sure that it's added properly. Or maybe the custom cabinetry that needs to be done, um, the electrical outlets that need to be uh, put in place. So all this needs to make sure that it's planned ahead. Not to mention the cables that need to be the proper cables that need to be ran for this. The other importance of this, of the tree prong, and like I mentioned before, is the design philosophy. It is important to choose an electronic professional, a custom integration with an aesthetically driven design philosophy that is in line with you, with your own. Knowing that the technology, knowing that they know the technology and the products and that the company should be able to make recommendations that can eliminate 
uh, consolidate and minimize the visual impact of, of this technology. And also, you know, like they will know for sure the right product selection. And we work together with them, uh, you know, at all times in my company as well. Uh, to make sure that they are aware of the different technologies. Every, every you know, technology advances so quick. So uh, we want to make sure that they that everybody knows what are the latest in technology. But uh, I can assure you that um, these professionals will know the right products for the right application and work with you to hide the technology when applicable. So... What are the methods? What methods are we talking about? And these three guys, I guess, uh, are trying to show us how, how we can incorporate these methods, right? So the methods of hiding technology is conceal, camouflage, consolidate, remotely locate, and at times we can eliminate a lot of these gears. So one of the most common ways uh, to hide technology or to hide something is to conceal it. Electronics may be covered with artwork or enclosed in cabinetry or retracted into a ceiling uh, with motorized lifts. Another popular method is to camouflage the equipment where the device is disguised as something else. Like speakers might be inter integrated into fake rocks or fox painted um, to match the wall or ceiling treatments. Um, the switches sometimes in, in your kitchen or your outlets can uh, match the backsplash so they're truly conceal or you know camouflage. Uh, let's talk about a two-way uh, frame mirror that can cover a TV to transform it into um, an entertainment system when needed. So consolidation is also another method, and that allows us to reduce the wall clutter by combining controls into one single keypad, like we saw one of uh, on the slides at the beginning, or maybe a touchscreen or a mobile device. And one of the other ones, um, tools here, is the remote location. And, you know, like, as we start including more technology in a room, you know, back in the days or before, we used to use, uh, use our regular furniture to conceal um, a lot of this equipment. But now, as we add more technology, obviously, this equipment is becoming large, and that's when we start uh, using this rack systems and uh, we can certainly move them into a different living space and relocate it into a basement or equipment closet where it's uh, not at sight, not to mention that we won't have to hear the noise that the fans sometimes produce or the heat, so that whole rack system can be completely isolated. And like I said before, um, possibly get rid of uh, some of the, um, eliminating some of the equipment altogether, like, you know, the example that comes in mind is, is lighting switches, right? Instead of having many lighting switches, we can have a centralized uh, panel that can control the whole lighting in a house. So how can we hide a display in a wall? So, you know, this is one of those questions, like, you know, the, the center and the most challenging of hiding a video display is like, it's being designed to be seen, right? We want to make sure that we see the TV. Um, but, you know, at times if you have a beautiful like decor, like in this specific room right here, you don't want to see the TV. You want to make sure that you're in a room where you're enjoying your company or you're just enjoying some time alone reading. So, you know, like one of, this is one of the challenges, like the TV is meant to be seen, right? So the first, um, one of their ideal locations, what, I mean, one of the things that we need to understand when we come in, I'm sorry, uh, on the projects is like when we discuss with the end users, like where is the location? What's the size of the TV that you want to have? And once this is determined, then we can decide on how we can hide them and uh, we can tackle that and, and, and hide the display. Um, one, of the, one of the examples uh, to hide a TV is to recess it in a cavity or a wall. And once it's, it's recessed, it can be hidden by a by folding door or a two-way mirror. Um, one thing to consider when hiding a TV is like in recessing a TV is the heat that it produces. Although we don't see that as much right now with the newer technologies, with the LED technologies, that's something that we still have to account. Uh, we typically suggest a minimum of two inches around the TV, around the flat panel for ventilation purposes. Um, another option is to use a small fan from behind the TV and then exhaust the, uh, the heat out of it. So these are items that we need to plan and that need to be planned in advance when, uh, when uh, 
when it's been decided that we want to recess a TV and block it with, uh, with some panels in front of it, per se. One of the things in, in lieu of completely recessing the TV, a lot of our professional installers recommend only recessing the mount. And this is actually a very clever idea that a lot of manufacturers or some manufacturers are offering. Um, and it just it is allows you just to hide the mounting hardware and wiring. Uh, so you do a recess just for that mount um, enough uh, with enough depth to hide the wiring as, as well. But it, so it can be switched out later at times. So join the meeting. Like in a few years, your client decided, like the say now he decided uh, to go for a 65 inch TV, but maybe in a year or two, he's like, you know what? That's a very small TV. Let me switch to a bigger display. Now you don't have to worry about making the cavity bigger because all you have to worry about is for the mount to fit within that cavity. And now you can switch it to a larger model or a complete different model altogether. So in this picture, we're seeing how, like right here, this panel is covering, um, and you see here how it uncovers the TV. Not only uncovers the TV, but if you see on the previous slide, there's a window here that, you know, that might interfere with some glare and some reflection on the TV. So this wood panel serves the double purpose of not only, you know, showing the TV, but also uh, covering that window for better viewing. Another um, way of hiding video displays is using mirrors. And, um, you know, like in this picture, you see that the TV here shows automatically. Um, and then there, there are different types of two-way mirrors. Um, there are types of mounting requires uh, special considerations, what type of mirror glass you want to use, the method of mounting the TV to the glass, the rear access to ventilation, one thing that a lot of people don't think is the, re the redirection of audio and the amount of source of ambient or artificial light. Um, you know, so this is, again, a very clever idea of, of enclosing the TVs. We see this a lot on the bathrooms, but we also see it on living room applications. Um, but like I said before, you know, there, there's a lot of considerations that need to be in place. Um, you know, we want to make sure, like I said, there are companies that sell the different pieces. So you need to make sure that uh, we plan ahead to make sure that we, we have the right materials if you want to do it that way. And also just making sure that the audio is redirected um, properly. A lot of people fail to, to think that once you put that display behind the mirror, you no longer have the audio coming out of the display. So you have to make sure that we plan for the proper and the external speakers either in one Left the meeting. In this um, next picture, you guys, we're gonna see um, a TV. This application is a complete um, integrated product. So we have a, a manufacturer, a few manufacturers in our industry that offer the full integrated product. This is highly recommended because then you don't have to be dealing with the proper glue or whatever it is that you need to use to attach the TV to the mirror, which uh, some companies offer. But in this case, it's a complete integrated product. So you'll have the TV already integrated in the mirror. They'll customize it to you. Uh, they'll tell you exactly um, what the, you know, the dimensions needed for this specific application. We also see here that we have accounted for the external audio so everything works at, at like like a one piece of product another uh product that you know that allows us to conceal a tv is behind artwork and some companies offer a frame that integrates a motorized scrolling art canvas that can be lower when the tv is not in use Another option involves a hinge motorized mechanism that lifts your own piece of artwork. And this is a great solution for those that, um, that have their own art pieces or they collect artwork and uh, they want to use it to conceal their TVs. And uh, this lift mechanisms are available in different configurations. They can either, either lift the uh, artwork vertically or horizontally. So again, that's, that's a very clever product. Uh, for something like this, we need to, again, account for the space behind the wall, make sure that we have the proper wiring, uh, that we have um, the right drywalling and the right um, um, uh, structure to make sure that it supports the lift mechanism. 
Another option here is um, it's also for moving panels. So if we have a system, a motorized system that can integrate wood panels or maybe art pieces that can uh, complement um, the different decoration in a room. So this um, this panels can can also be remote control and retracted when you want to watch your TV. And uh, this is another example of uh, products that have come out to the market most recently. There's a lot of companies in the industry that have um, come out with or uh, I got to say a lot of display companies, a lot of TV manufacturers that offer TVs already with an integrated frame or that they can uh, purchase artwork through a subscription. Um, you also can upload uh, your family portraits, some landscape pictures and to make it more look along with your de decoration in the room. There's also third party companies that um, that are artists and they do digital artwork that you can subscribe to and then purchase some of these art pieces. So now you can have that digital art piece being part of your decoration. So that's that's another new ways of concealing or, or camouflaging your technology and make it more interactive. You know, another way to conceal a TV and completely expose it when viewing is through the use of a lift. And uh, TV lifts are especially common at the foot of the bed. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, but it can be used in many applications. And as you can see in here, um, lifts are utilized, you know, in this case, in a kitchen cabinet. Um, we also see this application a lot in, uh, in the marine industry and in yachts. So this is, this is another clever idea of, uh, this, you know, um, hiding your, your video display. One thing is like any housing for a lift mechanism has to be very stable and must provide easy access to the lift for future service needs. So in something like this, again, the easy planning, it's, it's very important when it comes to it, just to make sure that we specify the right product. Here's another example of a lift mechanism at the foot of the bed. Uh, this is probably something that you have seen more often but one thing I like to uh, also talk here is like we, we're not limited only to lifting the TV. So let's say you're watching TV right now from the bed, but you want to move to this um, small couches in the back. Uh, this this lift mechanism uh, can also have a swiveling uh, um, product that can allow that TV to switch to the other side. So there, there are manufacturers that can also offer that as well. You know, hiding TVs uh, for drops, I mean, hiding displays for screens and projectors. That's, that's just another, um, you know, application that, that uh, it's very important to keep in mind. Uh, there are some applications that call for screens because, you know, the end user wants something larger than, you know, their flat panels. So where there's no room for something like that, that's, again, a consideration that we have to, um, to keep in mind. In a front projection, concealing a soffit behind a wall or even in a piece of furniture combined with a drop screen um, that is concealing the ceiling is, idea, uh, is an ideal solution for making sure that or for creating a large image without taking over the room. Like this is a great example in this room right here um, of a homeowner who enjoys watching movie in a room. But this room also clearly serves other functions like the family can enjoy the beautiful design of the room for reading or perhaps entertaining. And then, you know, the watching their movies on a home theater is used by a press of um, a button right here. So one of the things um, to keep in consideration uh, for digital projectors is like they, they are hungry for, you know, for the space and also to make sure that we have the proper ventilation. Uh, the projectors can go in a soffit. But uh, again, they need to make sure that we have the proper ventilation so the airflow, air, airflow uh, solves, um, you know, the airflow, it's the proper within the cavity. Also the fan noise uh, it's, is one thing to keep in mind. Um, but in this case right here, we can see that one of the best alternatives of hiding a projector is to put it on a projector lift. So it can drop down whenever you guys wanna, or whenever the end user wants to experience their home theater and then make sure that it gets coordinated so the projector and screen deploys at the same time. 
Again, like I mentioned earlier, um, this is a very um, important application, not only making sure that, you know, we have the space above the ceiling. In this case, for instance, like we had the planning of making sure that this panel matched the rest of the ceiling and that it can be seamless. Uh, we have to make sure that we have the proper space around the projector, that we have the proper cables, we have the proper outlets up there, that we plan for the right um, cutout for the screen, make sure that we have the space above it. And then there's other considerations like what we call throw distance, making sure that we have the proper distance between the screen and projector uh, for that proper lens and also the viewing. Um, you know, we don't want to be too close to that screen. A lot of end users want to have the largest screen in a room possible. But again, you know, one of the things to keep in mind is that we don't want to be sitting in that first line in the movie theater, right? No, nobody else wants to sit there. So that's that's one thing to, to use definitely keep in mind when designing something like this. Does anybody have any questions so far? I want to make sure that everything is, is being covered. Yeah, Marcio, it's anything? Uh, no, there's nothing in, in the chat there. Yeah. All right. So that goes for, um, you know, concealing and hiding uh, video displays. This second part, um, we're going to talk about the challenge of hiding uh, speakers. And, you know, this is, this is like a big challenge in our industry because they're designed to be heard. So obstructing them through the use of concealment might hinder their performance totally. And uh, the placement of, of audio is just like the projector I mentioned before or a video display. But this is the, the audio, you know, the, the placement is vital because of the audio performance. So how can we hide speakers effectively while still delivering the desired results? And so make sure that your client's investment on, you know, comes through this high uh, performance audio equipment. The other thing that complicates the matter is that many rooms these days don't just have stereo speakers, but they're equipped with a 5.1, 7.1, or a 7.1.4, uh, which is like 12 speaker, in higher surround sound systems and the different, um, the different options available. So there is definitely a lot of challenges when it comes to speakers and speaker placement and making sure that they sound great, uh, making sure that we, we asked our clients, so what, what is this room going to be? Is it going to be a listening room? Is it going to be a theater room? So, you know, there's a lot of pre-planning, uh, pre, -pre -planning, a lot of um, expectations that need to be met and, and a lot of um, early conversations with the end user as to what is it that they want to be listening. I mean, you might have an end user that loves acoustic music, so we want to make sure that, the, that we have the right solution for them and also make sure that uh, they're out of sight in this case. So we have um, some speakers, manufacturers um, that, you know, they, they seek the holy grail of speakers and uh, they have come up with this amazing solution, which is totally invisible wall of sound. And uh, this often, th this company offers speakers that are designed to be installed flush with the drywall and painted as hard as the wall. Uh, these speakers use flat diagrams or they work uh, via vibration um, technology so that they can blend within uh, the surrounding wall. But this uh, type of product require a level five drywall finish. Uh, one thing I like to mention too, like there are different companies that um, manufacture invisible speakers that not only can be covered by drywall or, or mudding, uh, they also make uh, invisible speakers that can be covered with um, wood panels, they can be covered with fabric materials, and even some of the stones. So there is a lot of amazing solutions out there um, that can these products can be incorporated in. But again, you know, like there's a, there's a lot of cabling planning, there's a lot of um, making sure that we have the right space, uh, the right placement of these speakers and, um, and you know, for, for this type of applications. So this image right here um, shows us like, you know, your, your planning for speakers, I mean, how, how intensive it could get uh, one thing that it's not mentioned in this class, but I have thought it before in, in uh, uh, sound isolation is the planning for sound isolation. I mean, imagine if you have, this is a two-story home and you want to put all the speakers here. You don't want the sound to travel to the adjacent room. So you want to make sure that that sound is isolated within this room. And there are different methods that can be applied for that. 
um, your custom integrators. I'm sure Boca um, Home Theater works with different um, applications and they have different methods, but all this needs to be planned in advance. Uh, the proper cabling uh, for, you know, for not only the speaker, but also for the integration needs to be uh, planned ahead. So, and again, emphasizing the sound isolation, because a lot of the times we, we hear this and, and we hear the complaints that the, the sound is traveling to, you know, the room above us or maybe next to us. So planning is very important. So this is the before and this is the after. Um, of the same room, and then we have the sound uh, properly planned right there. Um, the other method of hiding speakers, and uh, we've seen this more and more in the outdoor applications, and, you know, although speaker manufacturers have found ways to build speakers into objects, like such as planner boxes and rocks. I'm sure, like, a lot of you have seen the, the speakers and the, and the rocks. And uh, this, this picture just shows us a few examples as to, you know, how they can be integrated. And, and let me tell you, there's a lot of solutions out there uh, when it comes to outdoor speakers. Um, you know, one of the ones that we've seen lately is also outdoor speakers that match lighting. I mean, we know how lighting has become a big statement and uh, we want to make sure that we have that beautiful landscape highlighted with, with this lighting. So now we also have speaker that can, speakers that can match and they can get camouflaged within uh, the landscape design. So this is another example of, of how, how we can hide these outdoor speakers. Um, hiding the speaker behind fabric, I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen the dedicated home theaters and, and all the work that it takes, the planning that it takes. Um, in this home theaters, the speakers reside behind the stretch fabric right here to, pro to provide sound while maintaining a room aesthetics. Uh, there's a lot of uh, planning here. There's a lot of acoustically panel, acoustically transparent panels and, and treatment panels here. So that need to be uh, planned in advance and their location and whatnot. So another way of hiding speakers uh, that can be easily in case and cabinetry like we see in here um, or maybe acoustically transparent cloth. Um, and also in, in this media room, there's another solution also for screens. Um, like we see here, let's say you have more speakers behind it. We can get acoustically transparent material on these screens so that the sound can travel through the screen if you have, you know, if you have something like that. So, you know, there's again, there's so many solutions for, for something uh, that, that can allow the room to to change from a dedicated theater to just a, a listening room perhaps. And then in here we see like the blended, um, you know, speaker that can be installed in a wall or disguised behind it to, to blend it in with the surrounding using uh, Fox painting or, you know, the different methods that are available. Hiding controls is an integration and integration is, is key, right? Um, the picture on the left, right here and illustrates how different systems can be controlled by one interface. You can see uh, lighting, you can see shades, entertainment, music, etc. And all of it can be easily accessible from one control in this dedicated touch screen. In this centered picture is an example of an iPad, very old iPad um, that, you know, duplicates the functions of a dedicated touch screen. So the homeowner, if it's, uh, can control this remotely if needed, let's say, you know, like maybe like in my case, many years ago, I had my grandma living with me and she could not control the lights and she could not understand the, the keypads, but I can still control that remotely. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is a great advantage of that. And then on this picture on the right here, it's, uh, it's an example of an entry system that combines a doorbell, an intercom, access control keypad, and then there's a camera uh, on a single faceplate. So that's, that's a, a great example of um, what integration can be. Although like a lot of systems provide application or voice control, some technologies are still requiring the physical locations and the space where they're used like light switches or temperature sensors or door stations, uh, these controls can be conveniently uh, relocated. Like a smart lighting control system can replace like four adjacent uh, switches and a single gang uh, keypad. So all that can be consolidated through system integrations, not only to create more attractive environment, 
but to allow the system to work together uh, together better, allowing for for a much better functionality in the system. Uh, for example, like all, all this can be with the new technologies and, and integration, a single command can activate a scene in uh, in your house that can turn the lights off, uh, close the shades, um, turns the music off, and sets the alarm. So when it's time to go for bed, all you have to hit is good night, and all this happens. Or maybe your you know your client is going to have like a romantic dinner with um, with their significant other and then they can just put romantic scene and then the lights dim down and um, you know everything um, starts happening at that time and and the the mood is uh, set for that specific scene and uh, many electronic manufacturers and as we know and, and they offer different apps for smart devices for your iPhone for your Android and everything else so that that is also another option. Um, we rather have everything just control in one system, in one system, in one touch screen. But you know, again, these applications are also offered. So, how do we camouflage? Like, these are three perfect examples of camouflaging uh, different products and electronics in our house. Like, as with speakers, camouflage can be achieved with a uh, Fox painting or matching the faceplate material to the wall finish or, you know, or a nearby fixture. And then this, this technique makes the control virtually in, like unnoticeable. Like this examples right here demonstrates in this case, the HVAC grill completely covering camouflage. We have the keypad right here. And then, I mean, hard to see, we have the outlet cover matching this beautiful marble backsplash. So this is a beautiful way of um, hiding controls and or camouflaging them. And then a single control device can also be used for multiple functions. Like the picture on the left right here, um, you know, illustrates the multiple technologies that can be located in a room. Like you see here, we have the different displays, we have lighting, we have a projector. Um, so, you know, like it's, it's a lot going on, but all you need is one control pad, which can be stored in a drawer when not in use. Um, you know, the picture on the right, right here, and it's hard to tell, um, illustrate control, illustrates control switches typically found throughout the home, but this can be all relocated or, you know, to a less conspicuous location in the event that a touchscreen, for instance, uh, doesn't work. Uh, you can always go back to that area and, and get those functions working. Um, and what I want to emphasize, however, is that the controls for each of these individual systems aren't eliminated. They're just simply relocated to another room, to another area. Um, like I mentioned earlier, like the switches and perhaps like, you know, even your alarm keypads can be re relocated to a cold closet or a closet near the garage entry in your basement. So they're out of sight. We had a class a few weeks ago about outdoor technology and, and we've seen how homeowners are actively seeking ways to entertain outdoors. And, you know, here in Florida, as sticky and hot as it is, I think we, we all can say that we're very blessed to, to be able to enjoy outdoors and we want to be able to enjoy it more. So, you know, like all this has have a huge growth and now we, we see like outdoor living, including pools and spas, outdoor kitchens and barbecues areas, cabanas, uh, meditation areas. And, and so on. So this this space in a house, it's become very, very important. Um, we saw like examples uh, on a few slides before of outdoor speakers and how they can fit the landscape. Um, and in this picture right here, we can see how, you know, like hiding everything. I mean, you don't you don't really concede, like see it, but you know, you have a speaker right here. And then right here, you have a TV lift moving this display from, from this uh, cabinet right here up. And not only it moves up, but you can see that it also swivels. So, you know, all those technologies are being also applied outdoors. Um, there's outdoor rated, um, IP rated products that work outdoors, uh, like this TV mechanism, speakers. Uh, we have um, enclosures for projectors nowadays. Like, let's say you, have, you wanna have a large display outdoors. So, you know, this enclosure is not only um, protect the projector from the environment, but it also gives it its proper ventilation um, in an adequate uh, environment for that projector to last longer. 
So, you know, there's, there's a lot of options and there's a lot of uh, technologies that can be hidden in the outdoors as well. So, you know, this is, again, a perfect example of, of just one of them. Hiding cameras. So, you know, when I first read about this, I was like, well, how can you, you know, hide a camera, right? And that's going to be a huge challenge. It, it is a huge uh, challenge um, because they need to have a line of sight view of the potential intruders, which also means that they can be seen by those individuals whom we're viewing, right? On their, unless they're camouflaged in some ways. So this is actually a, an area uh, that has grown a lot. I mean, we know that, you know, the advent of webcams and high definition video and lower prices and video surveillance has become very popular. But also now we're integrating the camouflaging of these small cameras um, within, you know, this, in, in this case, um, a fire, you know, um, detector, a smoke detector, I'm sorry. So there's so many ways of uh, concealing these miniature cameras within your home and to make them almost uh, invisible. And in this picture right here, we see, um, you know, like um, the different uh, buoys and, and the, you know, the different surveillance shots from multiple cameras on a property. So, you know, we saw that foot of the bed um, lift. So now it's, this is incorporating uh, the different shots just to make sure that everything is, is properly um, viewed. One of the other things we wanted to talk is, you know, the hiding the equipment and how, you know, like, again, like I mentioned before, um, at the beginning, we used to have just a very small amount, maybe a receiver or two and, and your audio distribution. But as we start adding more and more equipment, like, you know, your cameras or, you know, you, you want to add your um, power surge protector. Now there's a need of a rack and these racks are very large and they diffuse and they generate a lot of noise and heat. So a centralized equip equipment room is a good way to keep equipment out of the way uh, of the homeowners and yet accessible for maintenance. Another way to conceal equipment and furniture is in furniture or closets. But um, we got to, oh, again, take, uh, make sure that we take the consideration of ventilation and the proper cooling. And, you know, like there's maybe, you know, ways to conceal it and to make it look more interesting. You know, so if this is a closet in a house, you know, maybe make it look more in accord, accord with the, uh, with the uh, decoration in the room. So, again, you know, depending on the method chosen, this requires uh, advanced planning for the 10th time. <laughs> in coordination with the architect, with the builder, with your contractors, the electrician or cabinet maker. And of course, you know, the earlier we come in and our integrators come in into this, uh, the, the easier the transition can go. So, you know, this is the summary of discussion. Um, just wanted to remind you, um, you know, like this, um, we have a lot of solutions for this. This whole class, I can mention many brands and many companies that we work with together with, uh, but the whole idea of the class is to keep it as agnostic as possible. Uh, the solution exists. I wanna make sure that you guys leave this class knowing that there's a lot of solutions. Don't, don't feel like you, know, you just hit a road, a block. Uh, please make sure that you reach out to your installers, your um, custom integrators in advance uh, so we can review the different options that we have um, so in technology, so we can properly approach it. Uh, we discuss, you know, how the advanced planning and design and philosophy, um, you know, like the design philosophy, finding somebody that can see that with you and making sure that the product selection, um, it gives you the proper functionality once the products are installed. And we also discuss the different methods and strategies for hiding technology in a safe environment. We talked, as I mentioned earlier, about making sure, like, if we're going to, enclose a TV or enclose a projector, make sure that we have the proper ventilation. Same thing for the rack equipment. Uh, so, you know, we, we sold the different strategies, uh, making sure that everything is, is in a safe environment. We also analyze how to work more efficiently with, um, with technology to achieve the proper um, design and aesthetics. Um, we saw that in many of the displays here on the pictures. So, you know, I, I really hope that um, that was something that, that we kept it. I mean, let's don't forget, uh, you know, the four or the three pillars of this uh, discussion, which is the advanced planning, like the design philosophy and again, the product selection. So these are the three pillars of making sure that everything goes seamless for the end user, um, that we work together and that we make everything seamless. 
Uh, with that, I leave it up to questions. I'm not sure if you guys have any questions for me. Thanks a lot, Vanessa. Um, so th this is the end of the um, of the formal presentation. I'd like to introduce a special guest, Alex, with Future Automation. So he's on the line with us as well and can take specific questions uh, related to perhaps a project or or uh, or a potential project where uh, hidden technologies um, might come into play. So Future Automation specializes in motorized mounts and manual mounts for uh, typically concealing TVs, but also projectors and lots of other things. Um, uh, I think recessing the mount is a very important concept that uh, I, I I like a lot. Everybody wants the TVs flat against the wall, and the TVs nowadays are so thin that if um, you know you, you mount them with a standard mount, they're going to sit proud from the wall, and and you could see behind them. And you can't um, hide things like Apple TVs, Roku's, or or Comcast boxes behind them. So recessing a box behind the TV to bury all that equipment, as well as the mount of the TV, means that the that the TV just splits, sits right on the wall. It looks like a picture hanging on the wall. So um, um, any, anyway, I'd like to open it up for questions. We've got a few minutes. We've got about five, six minutes left uh, in the hour. So you can use the chat window or unmute yourself and uh, speak freely. Jeff, uh, this is Jason. There was a question about the depth of a projector lift, which I, I did kind of address in the chat window, but there's so many variables. Maybe you or Vanessa or even Alex want to comment on that. So what was the question again? It was, yeah. Uh, the typical depth of a projector lift in the ceiling. Well, it depends, yeah, it depends so on the projector dimensions, right? Just to begin. Right. It does. Hi, guys. Yeah, Alex here from the future. Careful. Yeah, it does does vary on the projector Go ahead, being Alex, used. You want to take but that? Yeah, so typically what it would be if we're up to um so we have three models of the projector drop mechanisms. The two smaller models, which will typically hold up to around about Sony 295 size. You're looking at about eight inches of height required in the ceiling. Once you go over to you know bigger units, six nine fives, the eight eight hundred models for the Sony's, you're more around ten point three inches. So that's kind of where it caps out at around about ten point three. So there's also some other ways of, of hiding projectors. Um, a lot of the fancier projectors these days have what they call a warp engine in them, which means that they do not have to be lined up directly on the center line of the screen, which is, which is typical and has been typical for years, where when you mount a projector, you, you would say, look, I need the top of the lens to come in alignment with the center top of the screen. But the newer projectors, or I would say more expensive projectors, allow them to be horizontally or vertically shifted from that center point, which means you can put them in a cabinet and think of like a projection booth in a, um, you know, in a movie theater where that little glass window could actually be offset. And I've, uh, we've actually done some where the projector is shooting straight up, hits a mirror, bends that light 90 degrees and then shoots it forward. So um, you don't really have to bury it in the screen, uh, the, the projector rather, in the ceiling all the time. Sometimes it can go in the wall and, and shoot straight up. So I've got diagrams. If anyone is interested in that, I can, I can give you, um, you know, photos and, and examples of, of how that might work. But um, it's also better sometimes for accessing that uh, projector after the fact when you need to service it. Um, the, the last comment I would make there is you don't want to be single focused on the projector that goes in day one. You want to plan so that you could swap things out when 4K HDR came around and people wanted to upgrade. The last thing we want to do is have to change everything out just to do a better uh, projection because typically the screen wouldn't have to change in that uh, when you're updating a projector. There was a question also here on how to access the back of the TV. Is there a des the designated room behind the wall? Uh, that came from Sharon. So I'll just open it up and Alex can uh, can talk more. But this, a lot of, uh, if you're just gonna be recessing the part of the bracket, um, the, TV, the TV bracket itself is like a service bracket and it swivels. So it allows you to service the TV from behind. 
Um, you know, a lot of also, if you're going to be recessing the TV completely, there are different solutions that would allow, allow you to swivel or to move that TV so you are able to service it. Yeah, thanks, Vanessa. You're right. correct there. So there's there's a couple of options. Um, if you're just looking to recess the mount, then uh, we have some in wall boxes and mounts available that will keep the screen nice and flush um, once it's installed. But to service this, you would pull it out and it gives you around 15 inches or so. You can get behind it, adjust equipment, um, you know, make any changes that are required. The nice thing with that is, you know, we, it can stay on the mount. You don't need to take the TV down every time you look to adjust it. So that would be one option if you're just looking to hide the mount. The second option would be to completely conceal the screen. So you would create a niche, um, mount, use one of our standard brackets, um, mount the screen completely in the niche. And at the same, same style, you would pull the mount out um, nice and easily and be able to access all of the equipment behind it. When we recess active equipment behind a TV mount like that, we typically plan for a power reset capabilities so that you don't have to remove the TV to say reboot a cable box. Um, having the articulating mount for servicing is the only way to go, but it's not necessarily something that a homeowner would want to do just to reboot a cable box or an Apple TV because that's kind of, um, I would say, semi-frequent uh, that that comes up. So with, with proper planning on, on that, uh, you would be able to have a button that would reboot something uh, without actually having to touch the, the TV and get fingerprints all over it or maybe not align it properly when you put it back. Okay, let's see. When you're talking about bearing equipment on the wall just to achieve flush flat, what thickness are you losing within the partition? I'm not sure I understand that, that question. Um, Partition. What, what what is meant by the partition? Has left the meeting. Okay, if we're talking about the thickness of the wall, that the back boxes are designed to be standard um, sort of uh, stud cavity depth, and um, so you don't have to build a thicker wall uh, for that. You don't. You know, if you're on a block wall, that's different. You're, you're going to need to plan for that. But if it's a regular, um, either aluminum stud or wood stud, these back boxes will fit right in there. And uh, to get more room, we typically make a, a longer one, a taller one. Does that answer the question? Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, then uh, I guess we're exactly at 12, and um, this concludes our presentation for this week. Thank you very much, Vanessa and Alex, yes. uh, Marcio, and everybody for joining. Thank you. Thanks, guys, good job. Thank you. Thank you.